Uh, today I'm going to talk about stereographic projections and I'll begin by explaining to you why we need to learn about stereographic projections. Um, these days, of course, you can get computer programs to plot your projections, but you need to know what goes into those projections to use them effectively. Okay? So, this is a, a map, as you know. Uh, we don't actually normally look at a spherical map because it's inconvenient to carry. Instead, we use some kind of a projection. Okay? And given that we have taken a sphere and we've spread it out into two dimensions, there will be distortion. <coughs> okay? So, for example, the distance from London to Tokyo on this map is larger than the distance from Tokyo to Bangkok, right? But actually they are very similar. It's because we are distorting the picture, yeah? So I will show you how to measure the distance between London and Tokyo and London and Bangkok properly later on, okay? And that is why, you know, this, uh, this area, Greenland, looks like a very big country. But actually, if you take the top edge, it converges to a point on, on our sphere. Okay. So there, there's a lot of distortion here, but nevertheless, this is very convenient to use. Okay. So that's a, a projection. It's not the sort of projection that we are going to work with, but it indicates that you will get distortion. Now, very often, we are interested in the deformation of a single crystal. And this is a single crystal uh, of uh, cadmium, okay? And these lines are slip lines. So when, when you get slip and it intersects the surface, you're left with some sort of slip steps. When you apply a stress first to that single crystal, you've got to think about which slip system will be stress the most, okay? So there will be a choice of slip systems. Uh, if, it's, if it's slipping on the basal plane, for example, uh, there will be three different slip directions in that basal plane, and the direction which has the maximum shear stress on it will be the first one to operate, okay? Now, we can represent the deformation of either single crystals or polycrystals on a stereographic projection, and we can determine from that which slip system is going to operate first, even when you have 24 possibilities. So in a cubic crystal, let's say uh, an FCC crystal like austenite, there are 24 possible slip systems. You know, there are four different closed back planes, the 111 planes, and within each closed back plane, there are three closed back directions, which are the 101 directions. So four times three gives us 12, uh, and then you have the opposites as well. So there's 24 possible combinations of uh, possible slip systems. So when you apply a, a load to that, you know, for example, that turbine blade, uh, you need to know which are the slip systems which will be stressed the most. Okay? And you can do that by plotting the tensile axis, etc., on a stereographic projection. I'll show you that later. Now, I explained that crystals are anisotropic. That means their properties vary as a function of direction. And, you know, you can see from here that the modulus uh, in the one-on-one -on -one direction is bigger than the modulus in the one zero zero direction. Uh, I can't see behind the diagram here, right? So if I had a two-dimensional representation of how the modulus varies as a function of orientation, that would be more convenient. And we can do that on a stereographic projection. Uh, this is a, another example, uh, a transmission electron micrograph of a particular kind of precipitate in aluminum. And we need to understand the relationship between the precipitate and the matrix, uh, the orientation relation. We did that in the last lecture where we had an ordered and a disordered uh, phase. Ni3Al and a disordered Ni3Al, and I explained to you that they are cube cube. That means they meet edge to edge. So 100 of the Ni3Al was exactly parallel to 100 of the matrix, and 010 of the
the NITAL was parallel to the 0, 1, 0 of the matrix. That was a particularly simple orientation relationship. Here we have 1, 0, 0 of the precipitate parallel to uh, 0, 1, 1 of alpha and the other edge of theta parallel to a close back direction in the aluminium. So this is an orientation relationship and we can specify it by just stating two of those relations, right? But you might want to know where is the 1, 1, 2 of the precipitate with respect to the matrix. To do that, we would plot a stereographic projection, so I don't, I don't want you to worry about that at the moment. And from that, we can find the relationship between any vector in both crystals, okay? So orientation relationships uh, can be plotted on stereographic projections, and that's a very common use uh, of uh, such projections. Uh, you've done a lot on, uh, you are all familiar probably with uh, electron backscattered diffraction, uh, and here the colors are representing orientation as a function of uh, position. Okay? And the same machine will give you a plot which is a stereographic projection showing your sample axes and where each crystal's 100 zero zero direction is located or whatever direction you choose. So you need to be able to interpret that. And the density of these directions will vary as a function of position and so on. And that's how we determine crystallographic texture. That means a polycrystalline material in which the crystals are not necessarily at random with respect to your sample axes. So all of this I'm explaining to you just to show you that there is a purpose to do studying stereograms. I haven't explained anything to you as yet. That will come later. And this is uh, electron diffraction pattern. We will be going into those patterns soon. And again, we can use stereographic projections to interpret these patterns. I will show you how to do that. Okay, so let's begin with uh, a sphere in three dimensions, uh, the blue sphere, and we'll define some terminology. So if we have a plane which intersects the sphere and passes through the center of the sphere, then we get the largest circle, right? And therefore we call that a great circle. Uh, this is also another example of a plane which passes through the center of the sphere and therefore when it intersects we get a circle with the same diameter as the sphere and it's the largest circle. So that's a, a great circle and on our uh, globe of the earth, can you tell me what, is, what great circles we commonly use? Equator, yeah, exactly. And uh, any others? Yeah. So what are these lines here? What are they called? Yeah? What are they called? Uh, l longitudes, longitudes, okay? Now, of course, this, this uh, appears as if these are all starting from different points, but I explained to you that this top line converges to a single point when, you, when you're on sphere. So they are actually great circles going like this, okay? So those are great circles, and as you said, the equator is a great circle. So I was actually born uh, very close to the equator yeah, in Kenya, in Africa. I've got a picture of me on the equator. Yeah? So one day you should do that. Yeah? And wh when I go to Cambridge, there's another great circle which passes very close to my house, which is the zero degree longitude, the Greenwich Meridian. Okay? So I've been on the equator, I've been on the zero degree meridian as well. That's an ambition you should have. Yeah? <laughs> Okay, the, I'll go back to that slide. Um, these are latitudes, okay? And I'll come, come to those shortly. Mm. 
Okay, these are circles uh, formed by planes intersecting the sphere, but they are not passing through the center of the sphere. Therefore, their diameter will be smaller than the diameter of the sphere, and they are called small circles. So, if I take my Earth and I draw circles this way, then they are small circles, okay? And those are our latitudes. Small circles except the equator. Okay, so that's very simple. Now, what we are going to do is use this sphere to plot the crystallographic directions of, let's say, a cubic crystal. Right? So I've got a sphere here, and I've placed a cubic crystal right in the middle. And this is the 1, 0, 0 direction, the 0, 1, 0, and the z-axis here. So this is the conventional way of plotting a stereogram, that you put a crystal right in the middle, the 1, 0, 0 is parallel to the x-axis, the 0, 1, 0 to the y, and 0, 0, 1 to the z-axis. And this is the equatorial plane. This is the upper part of the hemisphere, uh, of the, uh, this is the upper hemisphere, and this is the lower hemisphere. Okay. So we've defined the axes of our stereographic projection. Uh, if I Look at this equatorial plane, I will have these two at 90 degrees and the 100 zero zero pointing outside of the plane uh, of that circle. So if I draw the equatorial circle here, then I can put a point here which is 100, zero zero, another one here which is 010, zero zero, and right in the middle we have zero, zero, 001 pointing out of the plane of the board. Okay? What do you think they would be? Yeah. Hmm? Bar one zero zero. Yeah, just the opposite. And zero bar one zero. And zero zero bar one is going into the plane of the board. Okay? So this is a very basic Stereogram where we are representing the one zero zero plane normals. Okay, these are the plane normals. So we are plotting plane normals. Now it turns out in a cubic system, you know, a plane normal with indices one zero zero is parallel to a direction with indices 1, 0, 0, but you'll see in another lecture that's not true for everything else. Okay. Right, now I want to plot on this uh, the plane normal to, let's say, the 0, 1, 1 plane. Okay, so if I, if I draw the 0, 1, 1 plane, it will look like that because it's not intersecting the x-axis uh, except at infinity. It intersects the y-axis at 1 and the z-axis at 1. So it's the 0, 1, 1 plane. And of course, I want to look at the normal to that plane because plane is represented by its normal. So that's the normal to that plane. And it intersects the sphere at this point here. Okay. So if I take that point and I project it through the south pole, then I get another point which is on this equatorial plane, which identifies the 0, 1, 1 plane normal. So that will come over here, 0, 1, 1. Now notice I've drawn 0, 1, 1 to be closer to 0, 0, 1 than 0, 1, 0. And that doesn't make sense, does it? Because it should be 45 degrees either way, right? So why do you think that is? Yeah. Sorry, I, I thought, okay, okay, yeah. So both of these angles are 45 degrees here. That means there must be some distortion, right? Uh, angles have a larger spacing 
towards the edge than towards the center. They are focused in because of the nature of the projection. Okay? So we are plotting plane normals and angles between them. And there is distortion. Now, without, without looking at this three-dimensional diagram, I could have guessed that 0, 1, 1 should lie on this. Why is that? Yeah, vector addition, right? So, zero, zero, 001 is pointing upwards. We have 010 zero, zero here. And therefore, this is zero, 011, one, one, right? So, it's in between. And this is exactly 45 degrees in this case. So, if I didn't know, uh, you know, where zero. So, for example, where would 101 lie? Somewhere on this line, right? In order to plot its position, we need to actually measure the angle and plot it, okay? But there's another, another clue. What is the symmetry of the 001 axis? So, let's say I've gone to some trouble, measured 45 degrees here and plotted this. Okay. What is the symmetry of the zero zero one axis? Fourfold. Yeah, it's a it's a tetrad, isn't it? Yeah. So therefore, I must have another one exactly there, there, and there. So this would be um, one zero one. What would this be? Zero bar one one and uh, bar one zero one. Now, of course, I can do the same thing here as well. This is a fourfold axis, right? So there must be one here and here and here and here. So what would I label, for example, this one? Yep, one, one, zero, and so on. Okay? So I've, I've actually jumped ahead, but you understand what we are doing, right? To plot the normal uh, of a plane, we see where it intersects the sphere and we project it through the south pole. Where it intersects the equatorial plane gives us the point on our stereographic projection. Okay? Right. Uh, obviously, you know, we need to think also about the uh, zero bar one bar one plane normal. And in that case, it's pointing in the opposite direction and it intersects the sphere in the lower hemisphere. So we project that to the North Pole and we use an open circle to identify that it's actually in the lower half. Okay? So um, that particular point. is a plane normal pointing downwards, so you would use an open circle to identify that. Okay? So that would be 0, bar 1, bar 1. So if it's a, if it's a fully colored dot, then the plane normal is in the upper hemisphere. If it's an open circle, it's in the lower hemisphere. Okay, let's uh, carry on. Uh, I'm, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this blue plane and extend it so that it uh, becomes bigger. Here. So that blue plane actually corresponds to this plane here. Okay. And 
all the points along which it intersects the sphere define on the stereographic projection what we call the great circle. Okay? So that is the trace of the plane. It's not the normal, but every point on this lies at 90 degrees to the plane normal. Okay? So that's called the trace of a plane. And supposing that I'm plotting the trace of this plane here, then that would be it. Okay? So this is the trace of 0, 1, 1. And every point on that will lie at 90 degrees to the plane normal 0, 1, 1. Okay. So, is that at 90 degrees to this? Yeah? Why is that? Uh, no, I mean, this pole, is it at 90 degrees to that? How would I prove that? Hmm? Yeah, dot product, right? So if I take dot product of this, uh, this and this, then bar 1 times 0 is 0, 1 times 0 is 0, and 1 times 0 is 0. Alternatively, you can use the Weiss zone rule that we did in the last lecture. That, um, do you remember? If that is true, then they are at 90 degrees, okay? So in this case, uh, HKL is bar 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 1. So all these products are equal to 0, okay? Similarly, I think you can show that 0 bar 1, 1 is at 90 degrees to 0, 1, 1. And uh, obviously, that is just the opposite. Yeah. So that's called the trace of a plane. So it's the actual plane on a stereographic projection, representation of the actual plane rather than its plane normal. Now, by taking planes at different angles to the vertical axis, we can draw a series of these great circles uh, and use that like a calibration of angles on the stereographic projection. And that basically is what the wolf net, uh, sorry, uh, I skipped ahead, but you can see the pole and its trace. And this is the wolf net. So here, uh, each little square is, um, let me see, is two degrees. And all of these are great circles. And all of these are small circles. And you can see that the area occupied by the same square is bigger near the edge than near the center. And that's the angular distortion. So a stereographic projection is measuring angles. right? And the wolf net allows you to actually work out what the angles are. So if I wanted to plot 45 degrees between the center and on this line, then that would be 10, 20, 30, 40, and 5. Okay? And you can see the distance from here to here is smaller than the distance from here to here, exactly as I drew over there. So there is angular distortion in a stereogram. So these great circles, these arcs that we have drawn on this wolf net, are truly actually circles. Yeah. Uh, the, the diameter of this great circle will be bigger than the diameter of the stereogram in general. Okay. So let me just show you that. So this is simply the relationship between uh, the diameter of a circle, the radius of the circle, and the arc that we see. If I measure the distance x and y, I can relate it to the radius of the circle. Okay? So the distance x and y, if I go back to this slide, let's, let's say we pick this great circle, then that is x there. Okay? So from that, you can simply work out uh, the radius of each of those great circles. And if this is my stereographic projection and this is the trace that we see, then this is actually a true circle, but of a much larger radius. Okay? Now, you don't need to worry about this. 
I'm just pointing out to you that each one of those traces is actually a circle with a bigger radius than the stereographic projection. Okay? This is just simple geometry. Okay, um, so if you have a pole, that's the normal to a plane whose trace is this, and everything there will be at 90 degrees to that pole. So every point on here is, will be at 90 degrees to that pole. But how do I prove that? How do I measure the angle between this and this point? Okay. This is fairly simple. Anything on here, yeah? Uh, if I just measure this, it will be 90 degrees, all right? But all other points are a bit more tricky to measure. And that's where, you know, the distance between London and Tokyo appears to be bigger than between London and Bangkok, all right? What we have to do in order to measure the angle between two points is that those two points must lie on the same great circle. Okay. So, supposing I wanted to measure the angle between this point and this point, then I've got to rotate the wolf net until they both lie on the same great circle and then measure the angle. Okay? Now, as you know, I can't run movies very well on this computer, so I'm just going to go to my website and run it from YouTube. Okay? Right. Okay, so we are measuring the angle between these two points here. And what I have to do is rotate the um, wolf net until those two points lie on a great circle. Okay? Then I can read off the angle. So the mistake that we are making in looking at the distance between London and Tokyo is that we first need to make sure that the two of them lie on the great circle before we measure the distance. Okay? And then you'll find that both London, London to Tokyo and London to Bangkok are approximately the same distance. Uh, these movies are on, on my website, so have a look at them at your own pleasure. Yeah? Uh, I can bring my own computer, but then it won't be recorded. The recording has to pass through this computer, okay? I'll show you once, once again. So we've got these uh, two points, and I want to measure the angle, so I rotate the wolf net until they lie on the same great circle here. Okay, so there's a great circle here. I can just count off the angles on the wolf net. But to measure the angle, they must lie on the same great circle. That's the basic principle. Here's a, another example. So, in order to measure the angle between A and B, I must actually have both of those points on this great circle. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? So you just rotate the stereographic net with respect to your stereogram until they both lie on the same gray circle. Okay, um, so we've dealt with uh, great circles. Supposing that I draw a small circle on the sphere, okay, like, like this. How does that project onto the stereogram? So, um, on this circle which is on the surface of the sphere, if I take the center, every point is at the same angle to the center, right? It's like a, a cone. Well, I, I project it in the normal way and I get a small circle on my stereogram. But because of distortion, the angular center and the geometrical center will not coincide. Okay. So you can see that the angular center will be moved towards the center of the stereogram relative to the geometrical center. So supposing I want to plot a circle 
so that you know, I can find all points which are at the same angle to the particular center of that circle. How would I do it? Because the geometrical center doesn't coincide with the angular center. So I've got a stereogram. And I've got a point here. And I want to identify all poles which are at a given angle to that. So how do I find the geometrical center of that circle? Well, this is a great circle passing through that. Yeah? Supposing I want to measure 20 degrees. Then I measure 20 degrees here. And I measure 20 degrees here. and the distance is larger towards the edge. <coughs> okay, so I've got my angular center. Then I look at these two points, here and here, and I've identified my geometrical center. Take halfway between those two points, and then if I draw a circle, every single point on that circle will lie at 20 degrees to the blue point. Do you see it? Shall I explain again? Okay. I'll draw it larger. So I've got a point here, and I want to identify everything which is at 30 degrees to this. So I first place that point onto a great circle, and I measure 30 degrees here and 30 degrees here. So this is 30 degrees and 30 degrees. Okay, and this is a great circle. <coughs> now I've got a distance here. I divide that by 2. And that gives me the geometrical center, which is somewhere here. Okay, Geometrical center. So I can put my compass at that point and draw a circle and that will give me all the points which are at 20 degrees to the original blue point. Not very well drawn, but there it is. Okay. <clears throat> I think this uh, a better diagram is in your notes. So here is a, a, a good example. Uh, I've got two poles here, and I want to find positions where where you would have phi one with respect to p one and phi two with respect to p two. So I draw a circle here, which is at a constant angle phi 2 with respect to this point P2, and a constant angle phi 1 with respect to P1, and I get two solutions here. Okay? So I find the uh, pole, which is at phi 1 to P1 and phi 2 to P2. Okay, um, obviously the angle between two planes will be the same as the angle between their plane normals. Right. So this is the plane normal P1, and this is the trace of the plane P1, and this is the plane normal P2, and this is the trace of the plane P2, and the angle here is the same as the angle here. That, that's, that's obvious. <coughs> Okay, um, so we've already exploited the fact that we can use symmetry to make the plotting of the stereographic projection easy. 
because you know we plotted one of these poles 0 1 1 and then fourfold symmetry requires that we have that sort of a pole here here and here and if I, if I apply the same principle to the 1 0 0 axis then I must have that that uh, and similarly if I apply it to this then this one necessitates that there is another pole here so we identified all the 1 0 0 type poles by plotting one of them and then using symmetry okay. uh, this uh, this is the 1 0 0 we're looking down the 1 0 0 direction and there's obviously fourfold symmetry here we are looking down the 1 1 0 direction so that's a, a, a dyad and what are we looking down for this one hmm? yeah 1 on 1 so that's a threefold axis of rotation why does it look like a sixfold? You know, if, if you are not careful, then you can see a sixfold axis, can't you? That's not possible with a cubic. Why is that? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, that's right. So these three atoms are not at the same height as these three atoms. The, the, the light, darker atoms are underneath. Okay? So it's not a six-fold axis, it's a three-fold axis of rotation. <clears throat> yeah, you're looking down the body diagonal of a cube. Right, so... Here is our basic cubic stereogram, which you can easily plot, all right? So I'll, I'll do that. I'll start again. So we put the z-axis in the middle by convention. We put the y-axis over there, and therefore this is 0 bar 1, 0. We put the x-axis here, 1, 0, 0, and therefore this is bar 1, 0, 0. And I'll draw the trace here of the 1, 0, 0 pole. Yeah, this is the plane itself. This is the normal. This is the trace of which plane? This is the trace of which plane? Yeah, zero, one, zero, because everything here is at 90 degrees to this, okay? Right, now we, the first one, one, zero, one type, we will plot by measuring the angle of 45 degrees, so this one will be 0, 1, 1. Therefore, we must have another one here, which is 1, 0, 1, 0, bar 1, 1, and um, bar 1, 0, 1. Okay. Between these two, what do I have? Yeah, so I'll put that as 1, 1, 0. This one will be bar 1, 1, 0. That means this plus this, okay? This one will be bar 1, bar 1, 0. And here we have 1, bar 1, 0, okay? So I'll draw in the trace of this plane here, which is this. I'll draw the trace of this plane, normal, is this and I want to draw the trace of this so everything must be at 90 degrees so note that this is at 90 degrees to this therefore the great circle must pass through this so I draw that and similarly if I draw the trace of that then it will be this and the trace of this plane will be let me see, this is at 90 to that, yep. Yeah. 
So we've done the 001 type poles and the 011 type poles. Okay? How do I identify where 111 will be? So let me just remove that slide. How do I find where 111 will be? combination of 0, 0, 001 and this one. Okay, so it's got to lie somewhere on there. But that doesn't help me. It's, the answer is not complete. Hmm? Yeah. If I add this and this, I also get a 1, 1, 1. Okay? Therefore, 1, 1, 1 is located over here. Okay. Can you see that? If I add this and this, I get 1, 1, 1. And if I add this and this, I also get one on one, right? And of course, you can see that there is threefold symmetry there. Okay. How about this? What is this? One and this one. Yeah. And similarly, this one will be one bar one, one. So we've got all four close-back planes plotted. So, you know, if you have a plane, you only need two vectors to define a plane. So you can say that, uh, you know, the addition of this generates another pole, but you don't actually know the angle unless you find another intersection. Okay? So that's, uh, that's very easy. And this is our first application of the stereographic projection. Notice on here I've got dots and circles, because we are also plotting the poles under the stereogram, okay? So, for, for example, this open circle here corresponds to uh, the opposite of bar 1, bar 1, 1, okay? And so on. Right, so what we are going to do now is use the stereogram to plot the symmetry elements of this particular crystal. So, this represents uh, a square, a filled square represents a tetrad, four-fold axis, uh, a sort of a filled ellipsoid represents a dyad, and a filled triangle represents a three-fold axis of rotation. So fairly simple, right? So this, when we plot symmetry elements, you'll see a whole series of stereograms later on in the course where we simply plot the symmetry elements with respect to the crystallographic axes. Okay? <coughs> right, so um, I've used plane normals which are fairly simple, okay? but very often you need to think about even higher order plane normals. You know, for example, one, two, three, and so on. And you can go through the same procedure to plot the plane normals on here. Either measure angles or do some additions. And luckily, you know, all this work has been done and computer programs are available to do this. But you now understand how these stereographic projections are generated. Okay? So I, I, I don't intend to intend you to, you know, find out where three two bar one is, but the principle is exactly the same as we've done on the board here. And the cubic stereogram you should be completely familiar with. You know, you should dream about it. Okay? Uh, it, it you know most metals are cubic. <coughs> Now, there's a particular term that is often used, uh, a zone axis, and a zone axis is simply a direction which is common to many different planes. Okay? So, if I take a great circle here, all of these planes have the common direction 110, which is at 90 degrees, because all the plane normals are at 90 degrees to this direction. <coughs> so, in an electron diffraction pattern, uh, the beam direction is your zone axis, and every spot that you see in the pattern represents a plane normal 
and that will be at 90 degrees to the zone axis. Okay? So you say your pattern is defined by the zone axis because every plane in that pattern will be it will have a normal which is at 90 degrees to that axis. Okay? On a stereographic projection, every pole that lies on this will be at 90 degrees to this particular direction. So you could say that the zone axis of this is 1, 1, 0. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to prove to you now that a mirror plane is the same as a dyad plus an inversion. Okay? And I'm going to prove that to you using a stereogram just to show you how beautiful the operation is. Okay? Right, so what we want to do is prove that the operation bar 2 is equivalent to a mirror. So I've got a point there on the top of the sphere which is labeled 1 yeah. and as normal I project it through the south pole and I identify a pole on the stereogram which is drawn here. Then the second operation I'll do is uh, a rotation of 180 degrees about the vertical axis. Yeah? So on this stereographic projection, that will bring this point to here. Okay? So here's the rotation of 180 degrees. So we've done the dyad. And this point still lies on the upper hemisphere. Okay? So that's not a mirror. If I now take this and I invert it through the center, okay, then I get a, po uh, a direction which is intersecting in the lower hemisphere, here, okay. and therefore that plots as an open circle. So where is the mirror plane? The plane, equatorial plane of the stereogram, yeah. it's that plane you reflected and produced uh, the mirror image. So we've just proven that bar 2 is exactly the same as a mirror plane. Okay, and it's very simple using this diagram to prove that, right? Everyone happy with that? So normally, you know, trying to think in three dimensions and so on causes problems. And what we've done is learned quite an important concept because you probably have already used stereograms without understanding what they're about. Yeah, you've, you'd have seen many papers with stereographic projections and so on. You can now actually construct a stereogram and interpret it in more detail. So we'll, we'll stop here today and continue with point group symmetries in the next lecture using stereograms. Okay? So the next lecture is after 10 days, yeah? because I'm going to go to Siberia. Oh, <laughs> absolutely true, <laughs> to a place called Tomsk. Tomsk used to be a forbidden city, because that's where the Russians first built their first nuclear reactor. Yeah, so in the Cold War, that was a forbidden city for foreigners. But, and, and also before that, they used to, so I hope this isn't being recorded, but uh, they used to exile. <laughs>